Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out this uh, late afternoon, early evening to listen to students, teachers, and leaders talk about learning and sharing their, uh, their experiences uh, with you. I'd like to first start by uh, thanking everybody that has been generously putting a lot of time and effort into preparing uh, the stage tonight and to facilitate all of the organization that's gone into uh, preparing talks and whatnot. So here's a list of all of our um, dedicated people that have helped uh, to put this together. So thank you very much to all of them. Please give them a round of applause. My name is Phil Evans. I uh, work at the International Baccalaureate and I have been a career educator for nearly 11 and a half years. Um, my focus has always been on lifelong learning and I have been privileged to be able to work for the organization um, for the last three years. My interest in lifelong learning actually started when I arrived in the US. I hadn't really thought too deeply about it until I found myself teaching in an IB program. What, found, what I found to be very interesting was the dichotomy of this school that had an IB program within it, but then the general population of the school didn't have access to this program. The classroom that I walked into had a row of lockers full of textbooks and placed on my desk was a big, heavy, larger version of the American literature book that had all of the um, questions and answers and um, all of the different stems and even activities that I was to do with the students based on the text. And I thought to myself, in this environment, am I some sort of puppet or robot? What is it that I'm supposed to do with this material? Where's the creativity and the, and the ingenuity uh, that I could exercise as a teacher? In contrast, the IB program that I taught in was able to give me an opportunity to explore um, new ideas and to learn from my students and to have a rapport with my students that helped me to become a better teacher. I felt like with the student-centered model that we were able to um, like look at different content areas and, and, and like there would be areas of, of, of critical thinking and, and, and um, literary study that students would come up with that I'd never even thought of. And I thought to myself, we're in the United States of America. Why does it matter whether or not you tested into a program or whether or not you had um, a particular school in your neighborhood that offered these sorts of opportunities? Why doesn't everybody have access to this in a, in a developed country? And so this has um, fueled my interest in the way that systems have been created to either empower learning or in sometimes to inhibit learning. According to the National Center for Education and the Economy uh, and, the, and the study of the PISA results from 2015, typically, um, unfortunately, the United States students are behind not only in reading, but in sciences and also in the mathematics. Their study actually sh uh, shows us that in the last 50 years, there's been absolute plateau in, um, in progress of uh, the way that um, students have been able to engage in mathematical uh, processing. And yet, it's the teachers that often get the blame. <laughs> and we, we often work very hard at strategy and trying to change the way that we uh, look at problems and we, we sit down with data sets and we try to analyze them. And frankly, I'm not a statistician, so I had a bit of difficulty with that, especially as a literature major. But um, driving, data driving, driving instruction has always been a, a common theme in education, and yet we haven't always seen progress come from that. So I thought, what about the system um, at large? What about the way we structure learning in the day? Again, the National Center for uh, Education and the Economy ha is sharing a lot of research, and one of them is about the teacher face time in comparison to top performing countries. You can see that the United States spends a lot more time in front of the class. So if we're spending a lot of time, but we're, our outcomes are not necessarily better, what's happening? Here's a graphic here that shows us that we're actually probably spending a lot more time preparing for tests. I don't know whether or not that's your experience. In Finland, uh, which is classified to be one of uh, the top education systems in the world, they have absolutely no tests. All right. So there's lots of variables, there's lots of complexities that are involved in this discussion. I don't want to make it sound so simple. But it's just interesting to think about the structures that we have, the time that we spend and what we're doing with that time. Unfortunately, many students fall through the gaps. 
when uh, if you know just think about it if you're if you're pushed to to continue to go to a class and to take tests over and over and over again that you're not going to be successful at that failure is going to do something to you how often do we want to go back to things that we've failed at so many times right it, it sounds a little I'm glad you laughed because it sounds a little bit funny so do these education systems actually support learning or do they inhibit learning I came uh, home from a conference in San Antonio, and when I got out of the airport, I got into a lift. And the student that was in, or the, the lift driver, was an ex student from a high school in the local area. And when I told her where I'd been and who I worked for, she said, Oh, we have an IB program in my school, but I wasn't allowed to do it. And I said, Tell me about that. No, she said, My sister did it, but I had chronic fatigue, and I, w I didn't get to school on time, and so I wasn't allowed to go into the program. And as we got chatting, she was um, telling me that she had aspirations to become a paleontologist. And she had trouble even finishing school. In fact, she was expelled from that school for not um, having enough attendance. And that wasn't necessarily the school's decision. That was also based on the number of hours that she had to be in school according to the state rules. The second story that came to me that actual same week was actually from a parent from a school district actually in California. Called me and said, is it the policy of the IB to restrict students from being able to stay in the program if they can't come to school? Because we've got a family and their daughter is sick and she really wants to finish and they're not letting her finish the program. And I said, absolutely not. That's nothing to do with us. That's to do with the rules um, based on, on, the, on the school itself. But the third story was a happier story. It was actually to do with the Mars mission um, that recently went up um, to, to investigate the, the surface of, of Mars. And one of the astronauts uh, was actually an ex-IB student and placed an emblem of her school logo and an IB uh, motif on the, on, the, on the capsule to go up to Mars as a sign of gratitude. And in the interview, she said, I'm very grateful for my, my teachers who brought work to my house when in my last um, semester or so of school because that gave me the opportunity to finish my IB exams and she became an astronaut. So why do we have some systems that work this way to, in favor of students and, one, and some systems and, and policies that, um, that actually work in opposition? And I think that this all really comes down to the way that we think about learning. Do we think about learning as a checklist of compliance um, regulations and requirements, or do we think about some, as something, as our superintendent just said, as something that continues to go on in different contexts? What did you want to be when you grew up? Can anybody remember what you used to think about um, being as you were a child? I thought that I wanted to be an astronaut myself. I thought I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be a fireman, because in Australia, it's super hot. In, um, at Christmas time, and we would have Santa come along on the back of a fire truck, and so that was my earliest memory. And we'd climb all over the truck, and I thought that was awesome, and I thought I should be a fireman. Um, lots of things change, but I'm still like all of those elements were curi like developed curiosity within me that that made me want to find out more and explore the world in different ways. Heather McGowan actually disagrees with this question: What do you want to be uh, when you grow up? And it's not necessarily coming from the same place. So as you're watching this little clip, I'd like you to think uh, just to yourselves whether you should think we should keep this question or, as Heather says, retire this question. And she gives a good reason why. World of work used to look like this. It existed in three bands, education, career, retire. Whether you went to university or not, all your education was pushed to that first third of your life. Career was getting that first good step on an escalator, which you rode up, to when you retired and collect your pension, and frankly died a year later. <laughs> it was by design. When Bismarck first set it up, I think 7% of people actually live long enough to, to collect their pension. Success measures for HR professionals, success measures in higher ed was, did you, could you prove the learning? Could you get a good job? That was, could you get your first step on the escalator? That's really all they were worried about. Now I think it looks like this. Life expectancy is pushed further out. It's not 90 yet, but it will be soon. Education becomes learning. That's different for me for a reason. Education suggests becoming educated, an end state. Learning suggests continuous. Learning overlaps with leveraging. It's no longer career because they're one act. And then retirement becomes, unfortunately, longevity. So it starts to look like this. The career escalator is gone. It's now a web that you must navigate 
dipping back in and out of learning. Learning is something that happens outside of work as well as something that happens very much inside of work. Success measures here are your learning agility and your adaptability, your ability to learn and adapt to various changing circumstances, to new jobs, etc. And this is my personal mantra, we need to retire these questions. What do you want to do when you grow up? We ask kids that. If the Bureau of Labor Statistics was right in 1999, 65% of the jobs haven't even been created yet. So we're limiting their potential imagination. 47% um, of work, not jobs. It's a, it's a contested figure, but a large portion of the work that we do can be replaced by technology in the next 20 years or so. What's your major? 27% is the statistics we have on, on people actually working in the field of their undergraduate majors. So if you have kids out there and you're asking them to pick a good major and stay in your major and don't go outside those lanes, you might be limiting their potential. And then what do you do? The, the best research I've seen on this was done by the Foundation for Young Australians, and they say that young people graduating today will have 17 different jobs across five different industries. So if you're defining yourself from the age of five on, by one goal and one job, you're limiting your potential. And I think humans have a lot of potential. So I think it's really important that we understand ourselves as learners, that we understand that it's not just the one thing that we, we've learned or that, that everything is interconnected. Um, I think that the way that we see ourselves as learners impacts the way that we can adapt and shift as, as technologies change, as things become automated, etc. The skill development that we need for the future is not clear. The jobs that, as, as Heather said, the jobs that we're looking to um, potentially take are not yet created yet. Um, I am one person who is slightly still working within my field of undergraduate degree. I did study education and, and uh, literature uh, when I was in uh, college, but I didn't, um, I don't, I, I'm not really specifically teaching anymore. In fact, I'm doing things more along the lines of communications and project management. And I'm learning as I go. I'm working in order to learn. So what are the skills that we need to think of most? In 2017, the World Economic Forum put out this list. They looked back two years um, into the, to 2015 and gave a hierarchy of, of skills. And then they projected to 2020 to say what skills they thought would be um, there for the future. But then along came the 2018 report, and not only had the uh, hierarchy changed and complex problem solving was not at the top, but the methodology had also changed. We see a, like a, a quickened pace to be able to mine data and information and to be able to come up with a list that now tells us what skills are relevant and desirable in the current year, 2018, of this report. But it's also the first time that we see active learning and learning strategies come into the list already. And we see that, we know that that is becoming more and more important um, as the years go on. So by 2022, it's going to be number two in their prediction. Learning to learn is the single most important thing that we can do in school and in life. It doesn't end with a particular degree or a graduation. Um, and I encourage you to think about ways in which you're learning all the time in and out of these formal contexts. My name is Phil Evans. Thank you. Thank you.